This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to easily and efficiently build and manage your own website. I'm Flygon HG, and in this video, we're doing a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Violet with only cats. In a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever, and I can only catch one sweet little kitten per area. The rest of the rules for this playthrough are shown here and in the description down below. I'll be doing every single boss battle in level cap order until my Jellicle friends face off against the game's final boss, AI Turo. So let's get to it. The starter for this run, as you might have guessed, is the Grass Cat Pokemon Sprigatito. Just like in my puppy lock, every encounter in this challenge will be named after pets submitted by members of my Patreon. But there was only one true candidate for Sprigatito, and that's this dashing little man, Grebo. Top 10 cat names right there. It's only been about 30 seconds, but I can already say that it was enchanting to meet Grebo. As a natural outdoorsman and a swashbuckling rapscallion with an insatiable quest for adventure, he's the perfect namesake for my first teammate. The Griebster's grass typing means that he's perfectly capable of trouncing Nimona and her terastalizing Palmy. So after some button mashing, we're free to scour the open world of Paldea for an army of kitten warriors. Our first recruit is a Shinx from South Province Area 3, named after this majestic jet black kitten, Pickles. Look at how fluffy he is. Pickles was loved by his owner Dakota for many years until he sadly passed away in 2021. But I think we can all agree that Pickles was and is a beautiful boy. Just look at him roar. It's a dangerous proposition naming a Pokemon in a Nuzlocke after a pet, and I don't take it lightly. So I'll be doing everything in my power to keep Pickles and every other one of my teammates alive and well until the very end of the run. My next encounter is the Static Eevee in South Province Area 5. Prior to my puppy lock, I asked viewers to vote on whether Eevee and each of his evolutions were a cat or a dog. From the results here, you can see that a majority of people voted that Espeon, Leafeon, Umbreon, and Vaporeon are all cats. So those will be the eligible encounters for this playthrough. But let me know which evolutions you think are cats and which you think are dogs in the comments down below. Anyways, my new Eevee is named Robbie after this goofy little tuxedo cat. Robbie loves hugging his brother Pearly, giving the camera the nasty stink eye, and making sweet biscuits. What an absolute cutie. I could watch this for hours. By making the trek to Cascarafa, I can pick up a water stone and immediately evolve Robbie into a Vaporeon. I don't want any funny business in the comments section, so behave yourself, okay? My final encounter for now is a Meowth from South Province Area 2. He has a wild flying Terra type and already knows Aerial Ace, so I use Pickles, who has evolved into Luxio, to catch him without any problems. Meowth is named after Carlisle, the orange cat, I guess. As a dog owner, it's really funny that most people have no idea what type of cat they have. They're just sort of like, I don't know, he's orange. Also, don't look him in the eye or he'll kill you in your sleep. While I'm on a random tangent here, did anyone else read the Twilight books as a kid and think that Carlisle was pronounced Carlisle, or am I just an idiot? Actually, don't answer that. Carlisle has pickup instead of technician, which makes him roughly 50% more useless than I was expecting. But I still give him a crack at the first gym leader, Katie, and her bug types. Even with the Terra Boost, though, Aerial Ace fails to one-shot either of her first two Pokemon. And I'm not trying to risk one of Carlisle's nine lives on five hits of Fury Swipes from Katie's Ace Teddy Ursa, so it's Robbie who comes in and cleans up the battle with a few surfs. Yeah, surprise surprise, getting the TM for a 90 base power stab move makes the first gym leader pretty trivial. Robbie could also easily take care of the Stony Cliff Titan who's next, but I let the Griebster take a shot at it. He's evolved into Florigato with the new level cap of 16, and since Cloth seems to have a personal vendetta against Arvin's Shelter, we can knock him out without taking any damage. Look at how proud Grebo is for doing a murder. What a stud. Brassius, the second gym leader, is next, so it's time for more Grebo action. He can learn acrobatics, which becomes a 110 base power flying move if the user isn't holding an item. And Grebo's hands are free, so Brassius' Pokemon are simply no match. It's a Grebalicious sweep for badge number two, and my adoration for the little fella grows stronger and stronger. 
but the Grebster will have to sit this next one out, as the Open Sky Titan threatens him with super effective damage. Fortunately, since Pickles has the ability Intimidate and his electric typing gives us an easy way to deal big damage, this isn't a particularly difficult fight. So it's off to the first team Starbase to face down Giacomo and his Dark types. Since he leads with Pawniard, I lead with the Grebster, who can learn the fighting type move Low Sweep, which is quite forgot to teach him Low Sweep. Well, that's a big mistake. Now none of my Pokemon have a way to hit Giacomo's Dark Types for super effective damage, and we don't have any Dark Type resistances either. Robbie is able to come in and take care of Pawniard, but he was never the main issue in this fight. No, that would be the Starmobile, and staring down this Cyborg Abomination with no easy way to take them out is pretty terrifying. Now is not the time to spiral though. I might be able to salvage this. Reverum kicks things off with a critical hit Wicked Torque as we retaliate with an Icy Wind to lower their speed. Not what you want to see, especially because the Starmobile is still faster on the next turn. Though a second Wicked Torque doesn't crit and leaves Robbie in the red. So my Slippery Kitty is able to retaliate with a Surf for a very solid chunk of damage. But that means that Robbie, my bulkiest boy, is now effectively useless for the rest of the battle. I switch to Pickles to get off an Intimidate, which is phenomenal as long as Reverum doesn't get another critical hit. For now, we're safe to do a bit of damage with a Spark, as the Starmobile goes for Metal Sound. With the special defense drops, we gotta switch to Grebo, who shrugs off a Snarl. I Terastalize to deal a little bit more damage with our Seed Bomb, as the Starmobile goes for a Wicked Torque. Slowly but surely, our damage is building up. I stay in for a second turn, and this time Giacomo goes for Metal Sound as another Seed Bomb whittles away at the Sentient Automobile's HP bar. Now it's back to Pickles to get off another Intimidate and tank a Snarl, which crits. That was way too close. Back to Grebo on a Snarl. This activates our Orenberry, but a crit from Wicked Blow will absolutely kill the Grebster from here. My hands are tied though, I gotta take the risk to get off another attack. A wave of relief floods over me as Giacomo goes for Snarl, which does just enough damage to drop Grebo into Overgrow range, boosting his Grass-type attacks and giving him enough power for one last Seed Bomb to knock out Revivroom and win us the battle. That was an extremely close call, but despite my mistakes, the kittens pulled through. It was a phenomenal performance from everyone. So now it's off to East Province Area 1 to recruit my next teammate, a Litleo named after Macy the Tortoise Shell Cat. She's the perfect namesake for a soon-to-be lioness. Just look at those claws. Truly nature's most fearsome predator. With our fifth kitten adopted, I head to Lavincia for the fight against Nimona. Grebo breezes through this fight without breaking a sweat, but this is a pretty significant fight for me personally, because it's the first time I'm laying eyes on a Quaxwell. Not a fan. Anyways, after obliterating Dewey Duck, it's time for the fight against the third gym leader, Iono. Despite having limited super effective damage into most of her Pokemon, this is a pretty clean fight. Carlisle makes a brief appearance to take out her lead Wattrel with a power gem. Pickles with an assault vest is a good check into Iono's friend-shaped frog. He even manages to get a freeze with Ice Fang. Skill is you, Iono. Tech W. Grebo is able to grieb all over Iono's Luxio with a few seed bombs, and then Miss Magius can be dealt with by a terrestrialized Robbie. His normal Terra type gives him Hex immunity, which can be abused for fairly safe switches between him and Pickles. A few turns later, Miss Magius falls, and the third gym badge is ours. The next Team Star boss, Mela, is walled quite effectively by Robbie. This fight was the main reason that I went for Vaporeon before any of the other eligible evolutions. Any moderately bulky water type makes quick work of her Torkoal and her fire type Revivroom, which can otherwise be pretty difficult. Robbie also makes fairly quick work of the lurking Steel Titan with a few surfs, but not before ruthlessly killing Arvin's Toad School in some friendly fire. It's a small price to pay for salvation, I'm sure Arvin and his Toad School completely understand, and there's no bad blood. By the time we get to Kofu and his water types for the fourth gym badge, Pickles has fully evolved into Luxray. He's now more than capable of taking out Kofu's first two Pokemon with a single spark apiece. Kofu's Crabominable can do a lot of damage with Crab Hammer, so it's actually Robbie who whittles away at him with Surf, and Grebo who ultimately gets the kill with a Seed Bomb, winning us the fourth gym badge. Grebo's so cool, I'd do anything for Grebo. If he told me to jump, I'd say how high. If he told me to run, I'd say how far. If he told me to surrender all my material possessions, I'd say I'm a happier man. And if he told me to subscribe to Flygon HG on YouTube, I'd say that kinda breaks the fourth wall, Grebo, but anything you say. In Greeb we trust. 
That was a pretty easy chunk of boss battles, but next is the third Team Star boss, Atticus, and without a Steel-type Pokémon, his Poison types are pretty tricky. Fortunately, we can get one more encounter here to make things a bit easier. From West Province Area 3, I catch another Eevee. She's named after Henrietta, aka Henry, aka Hen, another tortoiseshell kitty. As you can see, she's got quite the personality. When she puts her mind to something, there's nothing that can stop her from getting what she wants. Henrietta will need to tap into her namesake's unstoppable determination because she's crucial for my plan against Atticus. With a few levels and a lot of love, Hen evolves into Espeon, inarguably the most cat-like of the evolutions. The rest of them are definitely in a gray area, but more encounters means more kittens, and I don't think anyone objects to more kittens. With her psychic typing and monstrous special attack, Hen will be phenomenal into Atticus's poison types. The issue is that Atticus leads with the part dark type Skun Tank, who's not only immune to psychic type attacks, but also threatens with priority Sucker Punch. Henrietta's pretty frail on the physical side, so a Sucker Punch will immediately turn her into a ghost type. Fortunately, we can stall out all five of Skun Tank's Sucker Punch PP by just going for a non-damaging move that causes Sucker Punch to fail. I use Fake Tears to lower Skuntank's special defense, then Henrietta's free to outspeed and get the kill with a Hyper Voice. I make sure to Terastalize before getting the kill. Not to boost the power of Hyper Voice though. Skuntank is at minus 6 special defense, so there's no way we don't get the kill here. But by dropping our Psychic Typing, this baits in Atticus's Muck with 95 base power Sludge Wave instead of his Rev of Room, who no longer sees super effective 60 base power Assurance. Muck is the easier of the two to deal with. Sludge Wave doesn't do much damage, so two Psy Beams are enough to take him out. Rev of Room's Steel type means he doesn't take super effective damage from Psy Beam, but since we outspeed, I assume he's just gonna go for a Bulldoze. I assume wrong, and an Iron Head gets dangerously close to killing Henrietta. That was pretty stupid. At the very least, we can take out Rev of Room with another Psy Beam, leaving Atticus with just the Navi Starmobile. Through a series of switches, I can lower their attack with repeat intimidates from Pickles, as well as chilling water from Robbie. Noxious Torque ends up poisoning a lot of my Pokémon, but with their attack drop so many stages, Robbie can wall Atticus's mechanical monstrosity fairly well with a combination of Rest and Surf. Eventually, we get to a point where the Starmobile is in the red, and Robbie's at risk to a crit. So Carlisle, who has evolved into Persian since we last saw him, comes in to finish the job. Starmobiles can't be status, which apparently includes being flinched, so Fake Out was a misplay, and needlessly exposes Carlisle to a potential critical hit. But since I'm the greatest Nuzlocker alive, I go unpunished and Carlisle takes out the Starmobile with a Hyper Voice on the next turn, winning us the battle. With the new level cap of 36, Macy finally evolves into Pyroar, so perhaps she'll see some more use now. And by more use, I mean any use at all. So far, Macy's done literally nothing. Litleo is a terrible Pokémon, and evolving at level 35 is way too high. What is this, Generation 5? Nevertheless, Pyroar is a decent Pokémon, and fire types are quite good in this game. But forget that, everyone shut up. Grebo's evolving into his final form. Grebo. Rebo, 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 Meowskarada is a truly ridiculous Pokemon. His signature move, Flower Trick, has 70 base power, always crits, and never misses. By giving the Grebster a Miracle Seed and Terastalizing into his Grass-type form, this effectively gives Flower Trick a base power of 252. That's disgusting. And more than enough to get a clean one-shot into Larry's Komala in the fight for the fifth gym badge. His Dadun Sparse is actually bulky enough to survive one hit, but all he can do is nail us with a fairly strong Hyper Drill before going down on the next turn. That leaves Staraptor. His Intimidate lowers Grebo's attack, but that won't matter since Flower Trick always crits. We almost certainly get the kill here, but just to be safe, I pivot to Pickles with a U-turn as Staraptor goes for Aerial Ace. The Bird of Prey then outspeeds to hit a facade, but Pickles is holding a Chillin' Berry to keep him safe from a critical hit. In case you haven't heard, you should always, always, always play around those bad boys. A Volt Switch gets the Griebster back in, who now absolutely gets the kill with another Flower Trick. That was probably unnecessarily fancy, but there's no heckin' way I'm risking Grebo's life, I'll tell you that much right now. It's always better to be safe than sorry. That mentality is crucial in nuzlocking and in life, because life is full of risk and there's no way around that. 
but you can avoid unnecessary risk. For example, just a few years ago, a dear friend of mine called me up and said, Dr. Flagon, I need help. I want to create a website for my business or hobby, but without the proper tools, it's such a risk. So I says to him, Adam, buddy, you gotta use the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. With Squarespace's all-in-one platform, it's quick and painless to easily design professional and polished websites. For example, with the help of their customizable templates, I created poppyhg.com, the one and only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. That last bit really got Adam interested. He just kept demanding more and more pictures of Poppy, but eventually I was able to continue, so I say to him, Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, the ability to add and play embedded videos directly on your website, and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So Adam, if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. With that, Adam Adam was moved to tears by my testimony, and he instantly got to work making his website with Squarespace.com. He even went on to partner with them himself. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and for helping my close personal friend's acting career get off the ground. Now, let's get back to the challenge. Time for the boss rush at the end of the mid-game. Since Grebo is now a dark type and Pickles can learn Crunch, they easily take care of Rhyme's ghost types for badge number 6. Robbie easily dispatches the Quaking Earth Titan, and then it's back to the Grebster for the fight against Tulip Psychic types for badge number 7. That means that we've quickly made it to the 8th gym leader, Grusha. Normally, he's pretty easy with any fire type, and we have one in Macy. But Macy's Terra type is normal instead of fire, and her ability rivalry means that she does less damage into male Pokemon, which most of Grusha's Pokemon are. His lead Frost Moth is female, though, so we actually get a boost here. Not that it matters, since Flamethrower is quad effective. Beartick is second in male, but apparently Flamethrower is enough for the kill anyways, so I guess Grusha just sucks. The Titan has Thick Fat and Liquidation, but that means that Robbie can switch in for free. And then it's pretty safe to take him out with a few Surfs. That just leaves Altaria, who seems to have an incredible success rate when it comes to confusing my Pokémon with the 70% accurate Hurricane. I've never seen him miss a Hurricane, but I have seen him get multiple confusions in the same battle many times. Nevertheless, with some switches through the Electric-type Pickles, it's relatively easy to get Macy back in safely and then roast the Icy Bird with one last Flamethrower. That wins us the 8th and final Gym Badge. And with all eight gym badges, it's time for what you've all been waiting for. The most exciting, most exhilarating part of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. It's time to go to school. Yup, we're gonna learn languages with Salvatore. And we're gonna do it over and over and over again. And then we're gonna take the midterm. And then we're gonna do even more classes. And then we're gonna take a final. And then we're gonna fail the final. And then we're gonna take the final again. In my defense, the Pokemon language questions are bullshit. There is zero discernible difference between the noises this Pikachu is making. I'm, I'm being gaslit. Anyways, there's a reason for doing all these language classes, and it's not to get five medium XP candies. No, that's just the sweet, sweet cherry on top. You spoil us so, Game Freak. No, the real reward for doing these specific classes is that by doing them, you get to talk to Salvatore in different parts of the academy and push the relationship between student and teacher to the very dangerous precipice of what's acceptable. And as a reward, Salvatore eventually gives me a Galarian Meowth, who becomes teammate number 7. I name him Robin after this adorable cutie right here. Robin, aka Dick Grayson, got his name because he was a dick to his owners when he was first brought home which is an objectively hilarious way to name your pet. Sadly, Robin passed away in December of last year, so hopefully just a small part of him can live on through our little Galarian Meowth. And he'll be pretty important, because Steel types are phenomenal in most Pokemon games, but especially this one. Plus, thanks to his Galarian ancestry, Robin evolves into Perserker instead of Persian, who gives our team some much-needed physical bulk. 
But he's not the only one, because now that our level cap is above 50, I can head to South Province Area 4 and catch the wild Terra-type Leafeon that's waiting for me. I name him Fren after this very affectionate stray cat that one of my viewers took care of. Since then, Fren has found his forever home, and I can't think of a more deserving furball to be represented by my favorite evolution. I also head to Alfernada Cavern with the intention of catching the wild Terra-type Umbreon there, but try as I might, I can't figure out how to get to him without being able to climb up walls, so he'll need to wait just a little while longer. The fourth Team Star boss is next, and as usual, his fairy types are pretty easy. His lead Azumarill and Wigglytuff are dispatched by Pickles with a few sparks, and then Doshbun and the Rooch boss Starmobile are taken out by Robin the Berserker. After that, we can head to Casaroya Lake to face down the final Titan. Fren is able to pretty easily dispatch the Dondozo, but even with an Assault Vest, he takes a bit too much damage from Tatsugiri's Icy Wind, so it's Robbie that comes in and ultimately finishes the fight. With that, my Zoid can climb up walls, so I head back to Alfernada Cavern and catch the final encounter of the run. Thanks to a broken Ultra Ball, Umbreon hits Grebo with a foul play that would have just straight up killed him if it crit. That was pretty stupid of me, but One Ball HG is not used to dealing with faulty Pokeballs. Fortunately, the second Ultra Ball works just fine, and Umbreon joins the team before there's any more issues. I name Umbreon after Moonshine, who's technically a female cat, but the name is just too perfect. Take a moment to marvel at Moonshine's unrivaled athleticism. She is grace. She is beauty. Unfortunately, that's all the cat-like Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet. There's just not nearly as many as there are dogs, which is a bummer because I'm not able to feature more of your adorable pets. But I really do want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your pets with me. So many of you sent in so many pets. Special shout out though to the person who sent me 41 pictures of their cat Atticus. To be fair, he's very handsome. But seriously, thank you all so much. I hope this montage is just a small consolation for those that couldn't feature in the main video. And if you want to send me pet pictures for future challenges, consider joining my Patreon. Or you can become a channel member. I just recently activated channel membership on YouTube for people who can't or don't want to subscribe on Patreon. But anyways, with that, it's time for the final team star boss, Eerie. She can be pretty tricky, but we've got a ringer in Henrietta. As with Atticus, Eerie's lead likes to spam Sucker Punch, so we need to stall those out. But then a Psychic easily gets the one shot on Toxicroak. Lucario comes out second, threatening with Dark Pulse, so I switch to Macy, who retaliates with a Flamethrower for the one shot. Passimian is next, and since Macy baits out a close combat with her normal type, that gives me a pretty safe switch back into Henrietta. A Psychic kills Passimian and brings in Annihilate. But Annihilate's pretty bulky, so it's back to Macy on a Rage Fist which fails, and then right back to Henrietta on another close combat. With the defense drops, Psychic now does more than enough for the KO, leaving Eerie with just her Rev of Room. But since Fren is physically bulky and has access to Charm, it's pretty easy to pacify the car, switch to Robbie, and then take them out with a few Surfs. With that, the Team Star bosses are defeated, and all that remains are the final boss fights of the game. Clavel is first, but Grebo cools through much of his team all on his own. Night Slash immediately kills Oranguru. Obama Snow comes in second, so Macy takes care of him with a flamethrower. Gyarados is third, and because Obama Snow set up Aurora Veil, I bring in Friend to stall a few turns and put him to sleep with Yawn. Then Grebo comes back in and gets the kill with Thunder Punch. Poltegeist goes down to a single Night Slash, and Amoongus goes down to two. Last is Skeledurge, but Robbie with an Assault Vest makes quick work of him, easily taking care of Uva Academy's Headmaster. So now, it's the Elite Four, and as usual, we'll be using a single set of six Pokemon for this gauntlet. Here they are, all a little lower than the level cap so that we don't go past the next level cap of 63 for Arvin and Penny. My Kitten Warriors are strong, and with Commander Grebo leading them into battle, I'm confident that they've got what it takes. Rika is first, and her lead Whiskash obviously goes down to a flower trick from the Grebster. Camerupt is second, so it's off to Robbie on a Fire Blast before getting an easy kill with Surf. Dawnfan is third and has Sturdy, but can't do enough damage to my bulky water type for that to matter. Third is Doug Trio, so it's back to Grebo as Rika sets up a Sandstorm. But since Flower Trick never misses, we easily kill the triplets on the following turn. And then a Flower Trick one-shots Claude's Ire as well, winning us the first fight of the Elite Four. Can't spell Grebo without God. Second is Poppy, so it's time for Macy to let her Pyromaniac flag fly. 
Flamethrowers get one-shots on Poppy's Copperaja, Bronzong, and Corviknight. Magnazone has Sturdy, so as usual, they're able to set up a light screen before going down. This means that we won't be getting the one-shot on Poppy's Tinkaton, so it's off to Robin, who just dodges a Stone Edge. Fake Out does some probably meaningless chip damage. And then Tinkaton outspeeds us, but because she's not very strong, we can tank the hit just fine. And then our British exchange student retaliates with a close combat for the one shot. That's two down. Third is Larry, so it's time for the best Larry strategy in the game. Choice Scarf plus Strong Ice Move. Ice Beams from Robbie kill Tropius, Staraptor, Altaria, and Oricorio. I'm a little nervous that we don't get the KO against his Flamigo, so I switch to Henrietta on a close combat. And despite no longer being weak to psychic moves, with the defense drops from close combat, a psychic is enough for the one shot, winning us another clean battle. So fourth is Hassel. Unfortunately, Robbie's not strong or fast enough even with Choice Scarf to ensure an Ice Beam sweep. Instead, I lead with Pickles into Hassel's lead Noivern. He takes 50% from a Super Fang and then uses Volt Switch to bring in Henrietta. She too takes 50% from a Super Fang on the next turn. Or she would have if Noivern didn't miss. With the Volt Switch chip, a Dazzling Gleam is enough for the KO. Haxorus comes in second, but immediately goes down to a Dazzling Gleam. Dragalge is third and goes down to a Psychic. Flapple is fourth, and... you guessed it. Falls to a Dazzling Gleam. That just leaves Vax Calibur, but it's not quite over yet. I switch to Robin as Vax Calibur goes for a massive Terra Boosted Glaive Rush. Despite resisting the attack, it does nearly 50%. If Baxcalibur crits with another one of those, it'll just kill Robin, but I have to risk it. This might be a first for the Paldean Elite 4. Blave Rush comes out, but Robin survives. And since Play Rough will never miss after Baxcalibur uses Glaive Rush, that wins us the final fight of the Elite 4. Which means it's time to face down the Paldean champion, Gita. For seemingly the millionth time in this playthrough, King Grebo is our lead. And right off the bat, a Night Slash gets the kill against Espathra. Go Goat is second, so a U-turn does great damage and brings in Macy as Gita gets greedy and Go goes for bulk up. A Flamethrower finishes off the farm animal and Avalug comes in third, so Macy just turns her into a really big puddle. Fourth is King Gambit, and with the rivalry nerf, we're not getting the kill, but fortunately Robin can come in on a Stone Edge, and then get an easy KO with close combat. So fifth is Vuvuzela, which gives me a safe switch back into Grebo on a Liquidation, and then a Flower Trick fillets Gita's fish. So last is Glimora, but since Gita terastalizes into a pure rock type, one last super effective Flower Trick takes him out, and wins us the fight against the Champion of Paldea. It's a good thing that she's not the final fight in the run, because I could have done that in my sleep. The next four fights are definitely more challenging. Penny and Arvin have the same level cap of 63, so I go with Penny first. She leads with Umbreon, and if you had to guess, who do I lead with? Umbreon is bulky enough that a flower trick doesn't just straight up get the one shot, but it does enough that we only need to shrug off a single Dark Pulse before getting the KO. Leafeon is second, so I U-turn to bring Macy in on an X-Scissor. One flamethrower from her, and Leafeon is Leafy gone. Vaporeon is third, so it's time for a mirror match. Since Penny insists on wasting time with baby doll eyes, this is a pretty simple mirror. I ice beam her until she's at about 50%, then I get bored and bring in Pickles to finish the job with a spark. Fourth is Flareon, so it's back to Robbie, who gets the one shot with a surf. Fifth is Jolteon, so it's back to Pickles, who expertly dodges a thunder. Twice. I would have been really curious to see how this matchup went if Jolteon didn't miss, but it seems that the double misses have convinced Penny to just spam baby doll eyes for the last few turns, which nicely sets us up to kill Jolteon with a Volt Switch, since for some reason he has his hidden ability instead of Volt Absorb. This gets me a free switch into Robin, and with Penny down to her final Pokemon Sylveon, Robin is free to take her out with a super effective Iron Head, winning us the battle. Sadly, Grebo grew to level 64 from the experience in the Penny fight, so for the first time in the run, he's sitting this next battle out. Instead, our lead into Arvin's obese rodent is Robin, who dusts him with a close combat. That brings in Scovillain, so it's off to Macy on a Fire Blast. Then a rivalry boosted flamethrower knocks out the spicy peppers. Garganical is third, so I switch in Robbie as he misses a Stone Edge. I mean, nice. Stealth Rock there would have been pretty annoying. But now a Surf just gets us a one-shot. Toad Scroll comes in fourth. 
to seek revenge against Robbie for taking her out with surfs during the fight against the lurking Steel Titan. She's a lot scarier now than she was back then, and easily Arvin's most obnoxious Pokemon, since she oscillates between attacking and clicking Spore, seemingly at random. A switch to Macy instantly puts her to sleep, so I have to immediately switch to Moonshine for his debut. Despite a special defense drop from Earth Power, he can easily wall Toad Scroll by putting her to sleep with Yawn, staying healthy with Moonlight, and eventually taking her out with a few foul plays. Cloyster is fifth, but after putting him to sleep with Yawn, Pickles is able to come in and get the KO with a Volt Switch, letting me safely bring in Fren, who can deal with Arvin's final Pokemon, Mabostiff. Thanks to his Intimidate, Leaf Blade isn't a two-shot against the dog, but since Fire Fang doesn't do much to our bulky boy on the first turn, it's pretty safe to stay in. Even a Terra Boosted Crunch doesn't do much on the second turn, so a few short turns later, Mabostiff falls to a final Leaf Blade, winning us the battle. Which means that it's time for the final two fights of the run. Just two more battles between my kittens and a deathless victory. The final fight against Nimona is first, and she comes at us with everything she's got. Fortunately, with the new level cap, the Griebster is back on the squad and the perfect lead into her speedy Lycanroc. One flower trick, and you know the rest. With her wolf down, Palmod is next, which is nice because I can terastalize and knock that pest into next week with another flower trick. Palmot is able to hit five of my six team members for stab super effective damage. I'm glad to see him gone. Gudra is third, so I use U-turn for solid chip and to bring in Pickles with an assault vest. He gets hit by a sludge bomb which poisons. That's a little inconvenient, especially because Gudra outspeeds us, but we handily survive a dragon pulse and then an ice fang is enough for the KO. Orthworm is fourth, so I switch to Macy. The plan was to give her an air balloon for the safe switch, but I realized just a second too late that she has a charcoal instead. My heart drops and my eyes widen as I catch my mistake. I fall into a panic, completely helpless in a situation caused by my own foolishness. Is this really how I lose my first teammate? From a freaking Orthworm's earthquake? Thankfully, no. Looks like Macy was bulky enough to have actually survived even a critical hit, which is either a testament to Macy's bulk or Orthworm's suckiness, or both. But all that matters is that Macy lives and Flamethrower kills Orthworm on the next turn. So fifth is to Dunsparce. I switch to Robin who comes in on a super effective drill run, but he's bulky enough that that doesn't even do 50%. A fake out does a smidge of damage and causes to Dunsparce to flinch before Robin gets the KO with a close combat on the following turn. That means that Nimona's left with her Quaquavel. Quaquavel? Quaquavel? I really don't know how to say that. Since Gribo is intentionally already terastalized, he's no longer weak to fighting type moves, meaning that he can safely come in on a brick break. And then, do I even need to say it? A flower trick kills Nimona's disturbingly human-like dancing chicken. That wins us the second to last fight of the run. But can I close this out deathless, or will Turo's Paradox Pokemon claim the life of one of my sweet kitten warriors? After the Macy scare against Nimona, anything's possible. But one way or another, this ends right here. With the most badass Pokeball throw in the history of the franchise, AI Turo leads with Iron Moth, and I lead with Fren and the formerly Stray. With a single dig, he takes out the Fire Poison type Paradox Pokemon in one shot, baiting in Iron Jungle Gym next. Anticipating an Air Slash, I switch to Pickles the Jet Black. Jungle Gym doesn't do much with a Dark Pulse thanks to our Assault Vest as we retaliate with a Spark that doesn't kill, but does get the Paralysis, meaning that we can finish them off on the following turn. But that easily could have been a flinch from Dark Pulse instead, and then things would have gotten a bit scary. Iron Thorns is next, which means it's safe to go back to Fren on an Earthquake. Fren and Pickles are a pretty great team, huh? Another dig gets the one-shot on the Rock Electric type, leaving Turo with just three Pokemon left. But fourth is his Iron Sack, a very fast and very scary Pokemon. They threaten with Freeze Dry, so I switch to Macy the Fearsome. Iron Pouch just goes for Snowscape, though. I can't imagine that Freeze Dry wasn't a kill against Fren, so I wonder if this thing is always coded to set up the snow. Anyways, it's off to Grebo the Brave on a now-baited Water Pulse. Thankfully, there's no confusion, so with a Choice Scarf, the Grebster is able to outspeed and one-shot Iron Junk with a Terra Boosted Flower Trick. That means that Iron Hands is fifth, but we've got the perfect answer for him. Henrietta the Determined comes in and takes a pretty stupid amount of damage from Fake Out, but that's fine, because on the following turn, she obviously outspeeds and one-shots Iron Hands with a single Psychic. 
With that, Turo is down to his final Paradox Pokémon, Iron Valiant. And though Iron Valiant might be stronger, Henrietta's quicker, so with one last super effective Psychic, Turo's ace falls, winning us not just the battle, but the entire run completely deathless. And so ends another pet lock with everyone safe and sound. Just like the puppy lock, this one was a ton of fun. I got to use Pokemon I've never used before, and it really opened my eyes to how ridiculously good of a Pokemon Meowth Karata is. Skeledurge still has my heart though. With dogs and cats taken care of, what other pets should I spotlight in their own Nuzlocke? Any bird owners out there? Horse girls? What about people that own, like, hamsters or something? Let me know in the comments down below. And thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. I just finished a run of the ROM hack Blaze Black, and my editor is doing an amazing job making highlights out of those streams. And lastly, if you want your pet to be featured in a future Nuzlocke, consider subscribing to my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.